Today's message is entitled, The, the Time of the End. Reminds me of uh, the, the pastor who said, uh, you know, I'm coming to my last point. And then he said, in closing. And then he said, just one more thing. You think it's time for the end. The truth is, if we'll understand it, we've been in the end times since Jesus left and went to heaven. But there is a time that Scripture tells us about of the end. Today's message is one that is needed in this media age. For there are a great many preachers and teachers who speak about the time of the end. Many of them have great and grand theological education. Most of them have large and prosperous ministries that impact the world beyond their hometown. And I'm not trying to tell you today that they are purposefully confusing or teaching false doctrine. But I am saying that maybe their learning has confused them about the simple things of Scripture. Allow me to put it into a context for you. But far too many of our pastors today parrot others. They don't investigate for themselves. In fact, there are a great number of ministers today who don't preach messages that they themselves have researched. They find somebody they like on the internet and the book that they've read and they just preach what somebody else did. They believe what someone else has said about the Bible. Pastors do this. Is it any wonder that the, the average Christian just believes? In everything that I tell you, I hope that you will investigate the Word for yourself and find if it's true. And if it's not, come to me and help me see the light. Come to me and help me understand because I don't want to teach that which is not true or contained in Scripture. One of the other problems that we have is that we get cloistered into our little bubble. And what, what the people around us say is what, we, is what we hear and what we believe and what we understand, but we never look beyond our circle to find out if there's another interpretation of the Scripture. If there's another way to look at things words, meanings. And so we get pigeonholed. Rather than look for something else, we just accept what someone says to us. What a book that was a bestseller has been written. What the latest movie tells us about the time of the end. In spite of all the fanfare and promotion, a recent study suggests that a majority of Christians believe that when Jesus comes, the majority of Christians in America believe that when Jesus comes back, the world ends. Not all of the, the dispensational this year and that year and these things and those things, but when Jesus comes back, the world will end. What I want to know what I'm interested in is, is what does the Bible say in plain language, if you will? How can it help inform my belief and teaching about the time of the end? Today's message is one attempt to deal with this. Now, I've given uh, fairly extensive messages and teachings on this subject to new ministers in the Church of God at the camp meeting last year. This is a, a different way to look at the time of the end. And it's not the, the two and a half hours that I normally do. But I do this. So there is an end for this message as well. I hope to be concise but to cover the topic well enough that you may, you may also have understanding. Turn with me if you would to Matthew chapter 13 verses 24 through 29. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. And when the wheat
wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy has done this, he replied. And the servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you're pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first, collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned, then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. Now, you recall with me that a parable is a story, an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. The end comes for everyone. When the end comes, it, it doesn't just come to a few. It doesn't just come to, to some, but it comes for everyone. When the time of the harvest is given in this parable comes. A man, God, planted seed in his field, which is the world. Then an enemy came and sowed bad seed, weeds, into the field. God is the owner of the field. The enemy is the devil. And God allowed the righteous and the unrighteous to grow side by side until the time of the harvest, the end of the age, the end of the world. At that time, Scripture says, the weeds would be gathered into one pile and ready for the fire, and the wheat would be gathered into the barn, into heaven. I want you to please note that they were permitted to grow together until the time of the end. There were not seven years between the harvest of the weeds and the harvest of the wheat. Plus, if this parable is given to us in correct time order, the bad seed, the unrighteous in the world, were gathered first, and not the righteous. So many try to convince us that the righteous will be taken out of the world, and the weeds will be left to prosper for a time. That's not what this parable points to us. Later in that same chapter, Jesus gives an example of the net in verses 47 through 50. And he said, a, a fisherman cast out his net, and in the net he collected fish, both good fish and bad fish. Now in order to understand that, you have to understand the Jewish mindset, because the law said that there were good fish and bad fish. Not just the lunkers that we throw out, but that the fish with scales were the good fish for the Jews to eat. And the fish that didn't have scales, the one that Mississippi are so famous for, were the bad fish. The Jews were not permitted to eat them. There were good fish and bad fish. But the net, so it must have been a, a, the drag net, the net that they put out and then pulled behind the boat, and it collected everything that came with it. And in fact, it collected all that was in the lake. The good fish were brought into the house, and the bad fish were thrown out. But all of them were captured. All of them were harvested at the same time in the one same net that came. Finally, if you turn over to Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 34, Jesus gives us another glimpse, a different picture of the same event final judgment. Here all the nations, the scripture says, are gathered into one place. Notice it says that the nations gathered. Now there are a lot of people who point to that and say, well this is a different, this is a different judgment because it's the nations that are judged here. And while it does say that the nations gathered, which means that everyone was there, it says that that the judge separated the people right and left, sheep and goats. So 
the nations weren't separated. It was the individual people of those nations. If all we knew about the time of the end were these three passages, the parable of the, the wheat and the weeds, the parable of the net with the good fish and the bad fish. The parable of the nations where the people are separated right and left, good and bad, sheep and goats. You and I would have the understanding that it all happens at the same time. And these are not three separate judgments that come upon the earth. They're three separate ways of explaining the judgment to the people. Think about who were Jesus' disciples. Who were the people of the, of, the, of the age? There were farmers and fishermen and shepherds. And so that they all could understand, Jesus tells them in their own language, this is what you would do if you were the one harvesting the grain, if you were the one harvesting the fish, if you were the one bringing in the flock, you would separate them because the sheep and the goats rest in different ways. If all we knew were these three passages, we would, we would understand in one fell swoop, God comes to bring judgment upon the earth. Like the ancient mowing side, Jesus will send out His angels to gather in the people of the world and He will separate them. He will judge each person according to their words, their actions, their character. He will reveal who has been truly transformed and who has just been playing games. Who is holy and who is wicked. These are not multiple judgments. The same judgment. You must understand that every passage of Scripture in the Gospels and in the Epistles, the letters from the Apostles, agrees with this interpretation of Scripture. The first century, the disciples, the Apostles, who were there with Jesus, all understood after the fact, of course. They didn't understand it when Jesus said it. But after the fact, they understood there is a time coming when the world will end and all will be judged. Every reference to His coming demonstrates that when He comes, it will be at a time certainly when the world does not expect it, but it will not be secret, for the Scripture also says that every eye will see Him. Now to understand how we arrive at that, there is also, along with this teaching about the, the separate judgments and, and some people going to heaven before others and, and judgments coming at different times and multiple judgments, there is the idea that Jesus is someday going to come and rule on this earth for a millennium, a thousand years. But perhaps the reason so many people are confused about the end of times the time of the end is that they do not recognize the kingdom and the king. We sang that song first, started off today. You are my king. Well, Jesus is either king or he isn't. He's either seated on the throne or he isn't. But if he's not now a king, he won't ever. They fall, those who tell us that the kingdom is coming still, fall into the paradigm that the ancient Jews desire. There is something in them which desires that Jesus establish a throne in Jerusalem and rule from some physical seat of power, and yet nothing Jesus ever said points us to Him doing that. Jesus never encouraged His disciples to look forward to His rule. Now, they, they looked forward to His rule, but He never encouraged them. And in fact, whenever they would come to Him and they would ask about His kingdom coming, He would give them a spiritual interpretation. They were thinking this way, and it's easy for us to think this way, but Jesus never tried to be political or to build an earthly empire. When he spoke to the woman at the well, he told her, God is spirit, and those who desire to worship God must worship Him in spirit and truth. When he was on trial before Pilate, he was asked, Are you the king of the Jews? 
His answer should greatly inform us about the kingdom. My kingdom, he said, is not of this world. That was our call this morning. If we go back even further in the story of Jesus, when the Magi arrived to worship Him and present to Him their gifts, they went to Jerusalem and they asked the rulers and the leaders, they said, where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? He was a king at his birth, and if you will allow, he was king of the universe before that. He was king of creation before he was king of the Jews. Before he was born, he was already a king. And he gave up that place in order to come here. But then he was exalted to that place once again. He is ruling and reigning. If we look in Paul's letter to the Ephesians and to the Colossians, Paul describes Jesus being seated at the right hand of the Father. Now, Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. Is he sitting on a stool? Or a pillow? He's seated on the throne of power. The right hand was the hand of authority. The right hand was the hand of power. Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father. The Father is on His throne. Jesus then is given all dominion and power and authority. He's ruling right now from the perfectness of heaven. Why does He need to establish an earthly kingdom? I don't know. I tell you, He does not. He does. If you look back at Daniel chapter 7, Daniel is the one who gives us this title that, that Jesus uses by himself, the Son of Man. Daniel chapter 7, in his vision, he saw one looking like the Son of Man or a human being who was exalted, coming on the clouds of heaven. How did Jesus leave this world? On the clouds. And then he was given by the Almighty... He was given all power and dominion and authority. And Daniel says about that one who was given all power and dominion and authority that his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. It doesn't last for a thousand years. It lasts forever. And if it's already started, then forever is already here. We're just in the middle of forever and his reign. Paul gives us more insight into the first century understanding of the kingdom and reign of Jesus in his first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 15. He says, For as in Adam all die, so in Christ will all be made alive, but each in his turn, Christ the firstfruits. Then when he comes, those who belong to him, then the end will come. When he hands over the kingdom to God, the Father, after he has destroyed all dominion and authority and power, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. And the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Jesus, although God has given him an everlasting kingdom, Jesus will one day turn all power and authority all earthly power, all heavenly authority that is under God will be taken away and it will all be given back to God. Jesus will say, God, it's all yours. I've destroyed all of the enemies. I've taken care of all of the pain and the suffering and the problems and the temptations and the sins. And I've put them all into that everlasting darkness, that place where the fire is never quenched. I put them all there. In the Revelation says that death and Hades will be thrown into the lake of fire. His final conquest will be to, be to destroy death. And when death has been destroyed, life will never cease. Paul's understanding represents the best of the first century teaching about the kingdom of God and the end of time. The time of the end. Jesus is not waiting for power or authority. He is ruling now. 
He is not preparing for some future earthly kingdom. His kingdom is spiritual. And it is here now. We'll so look again at, at Peter's understanding. You say, well, he left out some of those apostles. Peter's understanding. Second Peter, he says, we'll find that his view aligns with Paul's. Jesus will return with the trumpet call, and the heavens and the earth will melt away, will dissipate. Everything that we know and see around us will be gone, and the real world will be revealed. The spiritual world will be unfolded before us as our eyes are opened to the, that wonderful reality. We will see the throne of Jesus, the throne of God Almighty, and the new kingdom, the new heaven, and the new earth will come down. And I want to tell you today, I've been given a wonderful, wonderful revelation from God. I know exactly when it's going to happen. The last day. <laughs> now, I don't know when the last day is, but all of it will happen on the last day. The last day is given in Scripture as the, the day of judgment for both the righteous and the wicked. If you look at Jesus' words in the Gospels, He says, I will raise Him up on the last day. I will judge them on the last day. The, day is, the last day is the day when the dead, all those who are in the grave, will be resurrected. And some will go to eternal life, and some will go to eternal death. Perhaps we spend too much time debating the timing of His arrival, and the nature of His arrival. And what we should really be doing is preparing for His arrival. It means that we should get our hearts right. And it means that we should be spreading the news. He's coming back. We should be telling everyone that we know, all that we love, and even those that we don't. Jesus is coming back. Are you ready? Are you ready? If today were your last day, are you ready? If Jesus were to break open the eastern sky today and end the world, do you know where you would spend eternity? Are you like the five virgins who had their lamps trimmed and ready, had oil in reserves, or like the five who were unprepared? Yes. I must be honest, I know some things about the end. I do not know when it comes. But I know it does. I know that He is coming back. And I want to be found faithful. And I pray that you will be found faithful as well.